Hello, everybody. Welcome to A Survivor's Guide to Hell, the podcast. I'm PJ Aubrey, here to walk you through this pessimist-friendly guide to finding the silver lining. Each week, we pick an unpleasant topic and share stories and information that will hopefully help you laugh, help you find a bright side, or even change your perspective on something. Thank you so much for listening. Today, our unpleasant topic is... Pests. Part 2. Last week, we told the story of a spider who was saved just by getting a name, and we also covered some misunderstandings about the bugs in your world. This week gets even more interesting with additional discussion from entomologist Zach Shum about how insects can boost the quality of your home and garden without the toxic chemicals and expensive treatments. As promised, we'll also be taking a look at how these so-called pests are viewed in cultures where the you factor isn't quite so prevalent. Once again, here's your hint. There's a lot of gods and psychoactives involved. Please don't call pest control just yet. You might be surprised by what's worth saving. Act 1, Part 2. What the bug expert has to say about some of the world's most hated bugs. So another one that we get a lot of is, uh, well, it's kind of a group. So like yellow jackets, wasps, hornets, things like that. I get a lot of just you know, inquiries into the lab on how do I get rid of them? What can I spray, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And uh, this is kind of, this can be a fine line because mm-hmm. some people have allergic reactions to insect stings. Mm-hmm. That's obviously a concern that you need to take into account. But if you know that you don't have allergic reactions to you know, bee stings or wasp stings, Wasps are really beneficial to have around, too. Um, Some of them are pollinators. Some pollinate more than others. Um, But a lot of them are scavengers for other insects, many of which are pests. Mm -hmm. So if you think of yellow jackets, for example, um, there's a couple of ground-nesting wasps. Uh, Many people have heard of cicada killers. Okay. Um, I'm trying to, or, you know, some people call them sand wasps. It kind of just depends. Yeah. um, a lot of these insects will, you know, they'll nest on your house or on your deck or somewhere, and you're kind of nervous about them being mm-hmm. there. Uh, but they're flying around your yard, and you, you, when you typically see them flying around your yard, they're kind of just flying above the surface, just back and forth a lot. Mm-hmm. And what they're doing is they're scavenging for insects. So um, they will fly into your gardens if you have a vegetable garden or anything, and they'll capture pests, and they'll take them back to their nest to feed their young. Uh, and they really do not care about people. Uh, <laughs> You know, they're loud and we know they're, they sting and we know they're mm-hmm. painful, so we kind of like to keep our distance and stay really far away, but that's usually not a problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, it can be, I, I like to describe hornets as a little bit more territorial. Their stings are also a little bit more painful, so hornets can be a little bit of a different story, but uh, one thing that I find with hornets is that they're usually present in the landscape, but we don't see them until the fall when all the leaves fall from the trees. Okay. And... We can see their giant nest just on the, the naked branch, right? Yeah. And I see this every year where, you know, there's public parks throughout, well, throughout Utah, but I live up here in Logan, and mm-hmm. um, the public parks, I always pick and find all the hornet nests because I just know how to find them. And they're never a problem, and they're never removed until winter when everybody can see them and report them. Right. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's always hornets and stuff flying around us at all times, but they, they don't really bother people. Um, they only are a problem when people see them, and then they can report them. <laughs> are, they, are they very active in winter when you're seeing their nests? No, they're not active in winter. Uh, they're usually just, they're, they're overwintering, essentially. Uh-huh. You know, and they're beneficial, like I said. So, yeah. you know, it's good to keep them around. Okay. <laughs> And one of the big ones there, so there's like little ground nesting ones and people will see little mounds of dirt yes. in their yard. Uh-huh. Um, if you see those, like those are eating a ton of pest insects. Mm-hmm. Like a ton of them. All right. So for anyone listening, if you're seeing hornets in your yard, you should be celebrating. This is a good sign. This is very good. Yeah. All right. Anything besides hornets and spiders that you want to talk about? As a generality, people do not like mosquitoes. Agreed. <laughs> yeah. But they're, I mean, they're a very... They're a very diverse group of organisms. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's thousands of species of mosquitoes across the globe, but only a couple hundred of them actually bite humans. Um, there are a lot of mosquitoes that are pollinators. Uh, there are a lot that are just like beautiful. I mean, there are some that are like metallic blue, really important to the ecosystem, uh, insanely important. So I get you know inquiries all the time. How do I kill the mosquitoes? How do I get rid of all of them? They bite people. 
Um, and there are concerns with mosquitoes, you know, they can transmit some diseases, uh, but, you know, they do provide a lot of ecosystem services. And I'll bring up one main one is that there are many fish species that rely on mosquito larvae to, as their primary food source, right? Yeah. Um, and there's actually some really cool stories about how mosquitoes actually are one of the main drivers in migrations of caribou. Uh, mosquitoes are also very good food for birds, uh, other animals and things like that. So, but everyone, the, the perception in general is that like, if we didn't have mosquitoes, like that would be so good for us, right? Um, but a little more complicated than that. <laughs> it always is. Yeah, it yeah. always is. And there's, there's a lot of caveats to that too. Like there are some species that aren't native to North America. Mm. You know, those we could probably be a little bit better off without. Um, but as a generality, yeah. mosquitoes are good. What would you recommend that our listeners do to help protect bugs like these? One of the main things that I tell people is to just go out and really observe things. Um, we, we really like to, and I'm just generalizing here, and I used to do this, like I used to be terrified of spiders. Um, I used to be terrified of these things because I was taught by my parents that they mm -hmm. bite and they sting and that they're dangerous. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, we are less afraid of things that we know more about. And if you just go out and you learn and you observe, you know, something that you originally thought or used to think was dangerous, mm -hmm. uh, like a wasp nest, really good example. You have a wasp nest that's hanging in your shed uh, just go like watch them for a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not going to come after you most likely. Hornets again are a little bit more territorial <laughs> from what I've seen, but if you just have a paper wasp nest hanging from your mm -hmm. house or your deck, just go watch them for a little bit. Watch the wasps fly in and out, um, bring back um, resources to help build the nest and just watch them for a little bit and realize that, you know, you're standing there for five or six minutes. None of them came after you. <laughs> None of them stung you and they're just going about their business, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the more we we learn about insects, the more we observe them, the more we spend time around them and understand that there's always insects around us, even if we don't see them, mm -hmm. we can really start to, you know, better understand that, you know, they really don't care about humans. Um, and that's one of the best ways that we can change our perspective about insects, especially ones that we think are dangerous. Well, I think you touched on some universal principles as well. Most things, it sounds so Disney, but most things you don't understand, you're afraid of. So exactly. if you're afraid of 70% of the bugs in your garden, I think that's wonderful advice. Yeah. Just observe them, yeah. walk away unharmed, and enjoy the free pest control. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And I, I remember the first black widow spider I found. I was probably 12 years old or something like that, and I killed it. It was mm -hmm. the first thing I did because I was always taught that, you know, they're deadly, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, even my parents always said that, and I, I killed it. And then I, the first the first Black Widow spider I ever found, someone, like, had given it to me that they found outside in a wood pile. And at this point, I had studied entomology, and I just had it in, like, a little container. Mm -hmm. And I was just kind of, like, watching it behave as I was, like, carrying it around and stuff. And I was like, I'm just going to hold this. Like, I'm just going to hold it. I'm going to put a glove on for the first time, right? But I'm going <laughs> to hold it just because it's kind of cool looking and it's beautiful. And it just kind of like wanted to walk away. It didn't really care that it was on me. Yeah. Um, and then I was like, I'm just going to take my glove off and I'm going to pick up this black widow spider. And I remember at the time my adrenaline was just really pumping. Like, I was like, oh gosh, like I'm being so dangerous right now, right? <laughs> and it turns out I really wasn't. Like, now I just pick them up all the time with my bare hand and I just kind of, so... Absolutely. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Let's just live in the world we're in and observe what's exactly. going on. Exactly. And yeah. embrace the world that we're in. Right? Uh -huh. Absolutely. Yeah. We don't have any predators here, right? That's We have the... <laughs> yeah, we have the luxury of chilling out and just watching. <laughs> yeah, out of all the animals on the world, we, we have it pretty good. <laughs> we do. We really do. I hope we don't screw it up. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, <laughs> you got to plant those pollinator gardens. And That's right. Well. That's how we're going to fix the world is the pollinator right. gardens. <laughs> One garden at a time. Okay, let's see. Here's our here's a less serious question for you. Actually, it's really serious. I need you to buckle up. All yeah, right. Yeah, let's, let's do it. <laughs> Are there any bugs that still creep mm. you out? <laughs> oh, Heavy. that's tough. That's really <laughs> so. I guess like not on their own. Like if there's just an insect in front of me, like it's probably not going to creep me out. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't really like. I don't really like some of the parasites 
So a really good example are um, mango worms. And if you've never seen mango worms, or if anybody listening in has never heard of mango worms, viewer discretion is advised, but they can like, <laughs> they can like parasitize your, your pet, like dog, not really, we don't really deal with it in Utah, but there are okay, some good. areas around the world where they can infest your dogs and they, they make, the, they, they just like are embedded inside your dog's skin, but you can like pop them out and it's really disgusting. Yeah. So if you're squeamish, okay. and like I, I'm not too squeamish, but when you can like squeeze a dog's skin and like all of these fly pupa pop out and they're just white and kind of gross looking. Yeah. That's pretty, that does, I don't care for that. But then if you have that larva <laughs> sitting in front of me, like it's not going to creep me out, uh -huh. right? I think it's just like the, the fact that they're popping out of the dog's skin. The, the context and the quantity. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm not a huge <laughs> fan of that stuff. Well, I'm glad you're but... not. <laughs> it's probably a good sign about your psychology. Okay. Uh, but then again, like, I think I'm a weird person that if I had a human bot fly, I would probably just, like, let it live under my skin and just let it exist. And then I could say that I harbored and reared out a bot fly. But that's a little bit different because, like, it's under your skin <laughs> and it's only, like, one of them, right? That is really funny. <laughs> But I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, again, I've never experienced it, so I might change my, my position on that. Maybe. But they're harmless to people. They're just like kind of a bump under your skin. That and is then... so interesting. Well, you know what? If you ever harbor the botfly, <laughs> rear and foster with loving care this botfly, I would I mean, love to hear about it. We'll make an episode about it yeah, to document you like your journey. I'll just like update you every week. I'm like, oh, it grew a little bit. It's a little bigger. <laughs> Today it kicked. <laughs> But I don't know. I Many... like to change my mind. Pretty mm -hmm. gross, but it's a, it's a good kind of gross from an entomologist's perspective. <laughs> Many great scientists have done gross, extremely intimately personal things for, <laughs> for their exactly. field. So yeah. you'll be yeah. in good company. I guess I can tell a story about how I, my main passion is conservation and really just promoting beneficial insects and wildlife and diversity in the landscape. And, one thing that really got me sold on that is when I was a kid, my dad used to take me to his place of work and it was essentially just a big business park. They had some large buildings that had these, you know, parking lot lights that were mercury vapor, like really bright and yeah. they attract insects. And so they had this, it was probably three acres, four acres of like just really old secondary growth with forest next to it. It was just like a fragmented piece of forest that was sitting there that had been cut down over the years. And, uh, the lights that were at this business park would attract these like, just tons of these giant silk moths which if you're unfamiliar they're like if you've ever heard of the luna moth like the luna moth is a giant silk moth so they're like you know pretty big and they would just be like covering the side of the wall in like from april to june and when i say covering i mean there was probably like a dozen or two of them which for silk moths is i had never seen that before that was the only place where you could see these giant moths without fail every single year right and I just loved them. I mean, I was fascinated by these giant moths and they're so cool and just beautiful creatures. And then one day they decided to like clear cut that forest fragment. And after that, I never saw any there, like for the remainder of, well, my life basically, right? And that like struck a chord with me when I was really young because, you know, I, I correlated that habitat meant wildlife. And if we don't have habitat, we don't have wildlife, whether it's, you know, mammals, birds, insects, whatever. There you have it. Insects help hold the world together, and habitat helps hold insects together. When you provide a habitat for insects, you're creating a mini world where the bugs get to do their thing. In return, some of those insects will clear the real pests off your plants, and even out of your home. Who knows? Observe long enough, and you may even grow to like those many-legged critters all around you. A few notes to my gardening friends. In addition to the spiders and wasps that help clear our plants of harmful bugs, ladybugs and praying mantis are wonderful to have amongst those veggies and flowers of yours. If you use pesticides to clear your gardens of pests, you may want to consider how these chemicals are damaging your soil, killing helpful biodiversity, and hurting the environment in general. Visit our blog for lists of plants that attract beneficial insects to your garden and save a few bucks on those nasty pesticides.
We've also included a list of plants that grow well in dry climates, courtesy of Amy Sibyl with University of Utah. We hope you enjoy the information, but better yet, we hope you enjoy the biodiversity in your own backyard. Act 3. Think twice before squishing. It may be a god. Sometimes in our family or community culture, lessons are taught without anyone realizing it. Perhaps that's why, in many American homes, a woman feels comfortable squealing if she sees a large bug, and a nearby man feels comfortable squishing it for her. In contrast, the Jainists of India, both male and female, tread carefully wherever they go. They brush the path before them with large feathers to ensure they cause no harm to the tiny creatures on the ground. Neither female squealing, male squishing, or unisex feather brushing was bred into our genes. In many cases, it was simply taught to us. Maybe we saw enough of it on television. Maybe we heard enough people shriek, "You kill it! Or in the case of the Jainists, perhaps they heard enough religion to grab the feather and swear to a life of harmlessness. I'd like to take a moment to nod to my truly arachnophobic or entomophobic friends. Your fears may have been established much differently than how I just described, but for many of us, we took a lesson from the people in our circles. In one way or another, we'll probably pass them down. Not every culture was inclined to be freaked out by bugs. Ancient Greece, ancient Egypt, and Mayan peoples were even prone to worship them for their incredible blessings and abilities. Of course, as you listen to the accounts of the ancient gods I'm about to describe, it's unlikely you'll be inclined to believe in bug worship yourself. However, keep your mind open. Some of these gods only made it to the limelight because of the incredible abilities of their very real buggy counterparts. It's time for a history lesson. First. Tithonus, how eternal life looks without eternal youth. The Greek legend of Tithonus is one of the saddest love stories I've ever heard. Tithonus was a mortal prince who was unfortunate enough to catch the eye of the goddess Eos, also known as Aurora. Eos fell in love with Tithonus and took him to Ethiopia. It seemed that all was well. Eos bore Tithonus two children and loved him enough to want him forever. Kind of. Tithonus was mortal. So Eos approached Zeus and requested her lover be given immortality. Zeus granted the wish with a cruel twist. Because Eos did not also request eternal youth, her Tithonus was destined to age forever, never dying. How someone like Zeus got to stay in charge, I'll never know. Eventually, god though he was, Tithonus began to wither. As his years stretched well beyond the place where his death should have been, he was reduced to nothing but an immobile, atrophied man of senseless babblings. What did his lover, the eternally young Eos, do? The Homeric hymn of Aphrodite says, When loathsome old age pressed full upon Tithonus, and he could not move nor lift his limbs, this seemed to her in her heart the best counsel. She laid him in a room and put to the shining doors. There he babbles endlessly, and no more has strength at all, such as once he had in his supple limbs. In other words, she dumped him. Eos abandoned him alone in a room. But where's the bug part of the story? Well, in the end, the sympathetic gods turned Tithonus into a cicada. It may sound like a curse, being turned into a bug. But the man can move now. He can even sing. These days, he has a gift that he didn't even possess in his youthful prime. He can fly. Of course, Tithonus is immortal, so the Prince of Troy is still out there somewhere. Perhaps he's wooing the prettiest bugs on six legs, or orchestrating a plague on Zeus and Eos' next picnic. Who knows? Maybe you'll hear him singing sometime. Story 2. Capri, the dung beetle that brought the sun. Most people would find it insulting to be called bug-faced, but in ancient Egypt, it could mark the complexion of a god. Kepri the scarab god has the body of a human and a scarab beetle for a face. Kepri was often considered the morning form of the sun god Ra, thanks to his responsibility to roll the sun into the sky every morning, like a scarab rolls a dung ball. Because scarabs would lay their eggs in balls of dung, the incubation of these creatures was hidden from the Egyptians. The beetles emerged from their nests fully formed and were believed to be created from nothing. Of course, such marvelous power could only be governed by a god. Thanks to Kepri, scarabs were honored throughout Egypt in various forms of art, including seals, amulets, and basalt heart scarabs symbolically placed over the hearts of the deceased. According to Britannica, 
Since the scarab hieroglyph, Kepper, refers variously to the ideas of existence, manifestation, development, growth, and effectiveness, the beetle itself was a favorite form used for amulets in all periods of Egyptian history. Story number three, Ah Muzin Kab, the Mayan bee god who brought psychoactives to church. The next time you're tempted to squish the bees sniffing at your picnic food, think of Ah Muzin Kab. He was the Mayan god of the bees, often depicted with wings and an insect-like torso. He was considered responsible for honey and beekeeping, as well as, are you ready? Creation itself. According to LearnReligions.com, the Mayan word for honey was the same as the word for world. So the honey god Ah Muzin Kab was also involved with the creation of the world. But the god's importance didn't end there. The honey in his stewardship was a critical part of the ancient Mesoamerican diet. Raw honey is a nutrient-rich substance, and one of the only foods known to contain the neurologically enhancing agent, pinocembrin. Not only did honey keep the Mesoamericans' bodies strong and their minds sharp, but it was a critical item for trade. With his health and wealth to offer, Ah Muzin Kab was not in danger of being squished anytime soon. At least, not by the Mayans. Learn Religions offers one more fascinating tidbit about the bee god. Archaeologists believe that Ah Muzin Kab was the patron of Tulum, and that the region produced a lot of honey. Some types of honey are toxic and produce psychoactive effects. It's possible that such honey was integrated into the worship of Amuz and Cobb. That's right! Not only did Amuz and Cobb bring honey to the masses, but he also sounds like a fun god to invite to a party. I don't know if Amuz and Cobb has even one remaining believer in these modern times, but I do know this. His bees are in trouble. In the winter of 2019, we lost 40% of them, and the number is still declining because of destroyed habitat, climate change, and pesticides. Even folks that couldn't care less for bees may care about the massive losses in food production that would occur without these pollinators. I'm not just talking veggies, either. Without bees, we'd not have enough plant matter to support our meat animals. Perhaps it's time to take a lesson from Amuz and Cobb and his faithful Mayans and give a little more aid to our friends, the bees. That is the end of today's stories. Now we invite you to join us for our weekly Silver Liners Challenge, which is designed to be an easy, actionable step you can take to help boost your week and help you survive hell. Here it is, the Silver Liners Challenge. Show a little extra mercy to a bug this week. It could be as simple as releasing a spider rather than squishing it. Or it can be as impactful as planting a few pollen-rich flowers that expand your local bee habitat. Either way, you may find these bothersome bugs paying it forward by protecting your garden, producing your food, and enriching your world. Feel free to share your experiences in the comments of our website, www.survivorsguidetohell.com, or on our Facebook page. This is a podcast version of our sister production, A Survivor's Guide to Hell, the blog, this podcast gives you a way to access our content when you're driving, cleaning house, or planting a bee tree. But if you'd like to see the videos and pictures that often accompany our posts, like original depictions of insect gods, check out our website at www.survivorsguidetohell.com, where you'll also find much more information, including our storytelling code of ethics. We're always looking for cool new stories. If you have something to share, please visit our site and drop us a line. And remember, if you liked this episode, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. Listen, we're on a budget, and apparently podcasts, websites, and recording equipment aren't free. If you'd like to help out, please visit the support portion of our site and see what you can do to contribute. I promise some good karma coming your way. Last but not least, our cheesy joke of the week. A man had a pet centipede. He said, centipede, go get the paper and make it fast. A half hour later, the man went outside and said, I thought I told you to get the paper a half hour ago. Well, I had to put on my shoes, said the centipede. Meh, bug joke. Thank you, everybody, and have a great Monday!